right, we are with the amazing Dr. Tom Yankulov, who is the director of the Center for Computational Oncology at the Odin Institute for Computational Engineering and Sciences, and the professor of biomedical engineering at, uh, uh, at the University of uh, Texas at uh, Austin. So uh, thank you very much, Tom, for, for being here. Uh, I heard an amazing talk from you once at uh, one of our meetings, and you've been absolutely leading in the space of um, uh, using mathematical models, um, image-based mathematical models to, to, to better predict outcomes and, and to do predictive oncology. So thank you for being here uh, and would, would love to hear your thoughts um, and your efforts uh, because I think it could be quite inspiring. All right, well, cool. Thanks so much for the opportunity and I, I hope it doesn't disappoint mm -hmm. and I'll just start in. Of course, you can um, uh, pop in and, and direct me as we go here, okay? Yep. So I'll, I'll start, start off by trying to um, uh, motivate people or get people interested. So in the 1940s, the U.S. Air Force was trying to build its first generation fighter jets, and there was a rash of crashes, and um, uh, they, were, they were trying to figure out why. And it didn't seem like any of the engineering was the problem, but the problem turned out to be that the pilots were terribly uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So they hired this young scientist, this guy named Gilbert Daniels, to measure a whole bunch of different dimensions on a um, uh, on the pilots. So there's actually bigger than 4,000 pilots. And what they decide was that there's going to be a list of these 10 top dimensions that they figure were going to be the most important in determining how to build a cockpit for these for these pilots. And what they did is they tried to find the pilots that were within this average of this 10 dimensional space here. And so this average was also defined in a very liberal way. It was the mean plus or minus 30%. So this is a really big average. And the question is, is of those 4,000 pilots, how many fit in that average 10 dimensional space? Well, actually zero of them did. And so what they came up with this, this, this very dramatic statement that if you design the cockpit to fit the average pilot, then you were designing it to fit no one. And the guy who ran the study says, once we showed them that the average pilot was a useless concept, they were able to focus on fitting the cockpit to the individual and starting to give the seats all these different maneuverabilities. And I'm not an expert in the area, of course, but uh, I'm told that this is, or I've read that this is actually some of the adjustments that you have in your car seats now um, uh, had their start in trying to build these seats that were more comfortable for pilots. And so now they're designed to fit, fit a big range of the, the potential pilot sizes. And so this can, be, this can lead you to the statement that any ranking based on these averaged and unconnected quantities is going to be severely limited in its practical utility, which then brings us to, you know, kind of the thrust of today's uh, discussion, which is going to be that the fundamental issue with clinical trials, is, as I see it in my infinite wisdom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it's funny. It's funny. It, I mean, it's not funny. It's, it's, it's quite shocking to, to, to see what you just mentioned, as this historical context is amazing. And, you know, we're used to hearing about the, the average man, for example, in certain, you know, certain uh, designs of you know anthropomorphic phantoms and people using it right. to understand things and yet you know the average person what does that even mean right right so, and yeah. so it's it's actually even worse than that because this is this was this was done in the 1940s in the United States those 4,000 pilots were pretty homogeneous they all looked like me right so it, so uh, you don't you're not even talking about the diversity that's natural in a yeah in this country's population um uh, Right, so the clinical trials, of course, are designed to identify an intervention that kind of works best for the population, but there really is no average person. We told this anecdote on the previous slide, but there's lots of other studies that indicate that there's just simply not an average person. Mm -hmm. So at the risk of being overdramatic, by finding the therapeutic regimen that works best for the population, you know, for everyone to some degree, you're really finding the therapeutic regimen that's gonna work the best for no one. Uh, but we can't throw statistical inference out the window. Of course, it's enormously powerful, but it does rely on properties of large populations that obscure conditions specific to the individual. And this is an enormous problem for high consequence decisions like oncology, where the patients are so heterogeneous in both space and time. So you really need to incorporate the underlying biophysical processes that can be calibrated with patient-specific data to make patient-specific predictions. So rather than try to go to a very large training data set to come up with the way to do it for the individual, you rely strictly on the individual's data set. And so, so, so uh, I, I, yeah. Yeah, I mean, sometimes when new therapies show up, I'll give you just one example from you know my, my end of experiences, you know, uh, 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 radio pharmaceutical therapies, you know, you got first generation, second generation, you know, amazing stuff that shows up, new molecules that are being designed. 
and people get overly excited. You go through the FDA approval and it's all amazing, yet they're not personalized. They're not optimized. And people are already sort of applauding. They're saying, this is amazing. And yet we know systematically, you know, patients are being under over treated, often right. under treated because we're being overly conservative, for example, and we're not paying enough attention to, to personalization by any means. Right? Yeah. It's it, the, the, that I'm glad you brought that up actually, because the, 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 you know, how, the question of merely how do you give a drug to a patient is an open question because in a clinical trial, right, in a phase one, most phase ones are designed to find the maximum tolerated dose. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the question of how you're delivering that to the patient is, is largely left unexplored. And of course, a patient doesn't get just one drug, depending on the subtype of disease, you know, they could get five or six drugs over multiple regimens. And so the question is, is how do you order and, and how do you order those and how do you dose them and how do you, how's the timing? And um, if you're trying to do that in a clinical trial approach, there's not enough patients and there's not enough resources to try all the different ways you could order the drugs. You have to have a mathematical model underneath the hood that you could calibrate with individual patient data, go on the computer and potentially simulate all the different ways that you could give the, 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 the approved drugs because that's much likely, more likely to land on a, a patient-specific um, uh, so dosing you have, scheme. Yeah. You do a virtual therapy in a right. get get an idea yeah. of what you think is going to be a better solution, and of course, then you deliver what you think is the best solution. That's right. Yep. Yeah. That's right. I mean, historically, people have thought, well, that's just too complicated. You know, how how are computational models ever going to catch up to their to reality? Yeah. Right. So I think people have probably even given up on that in the past. Right. So I guess you're just. I think that's a great point. I do think I, you know, I might be overly optimistic and, and, and I don't know if it'll come from our lab, but I think this is kind of inevitable. If you look at the history of science, once we mathematize something, we kind of get good at it. It's actually already happened in cardiology. If you look up this company, HeartFlow, you yeah. know, they take CT images before and after contrast agent, and now they can say whether or not you need to have a stent in place. Um, uh, uh, and, and then not only if you need the stent, where you place it, because they can simulate on the individual patient where it needs to be placed. So yep. this is where this is the, where the field is going. Yep. Um, uh, yeah. So how do we do this? So this is the, the outline of the, of the meat of the presentation, a quick summary of two different imaging techniques that are based on uh, magnetic resonance imaging. There's, of course, lots of ways to proceed here. But in the time, we'll talk about dynamic contrast enhanced and diffusion weighted. Then I'll spend a few sides on building a biology-based mathematical model that we can then calibrate with the patient-specific MRI data, and then talk about how that can go into um, uh, building digital twins and doing n equals one trials, like you just, like we just talked about. Yeah. So here's the summary. So these are the two data sets we'll talk about today. This is images that are taken before and after the injection of a contrast agent, and what you're looking at here is a little movie that's looping around here. This is a sagittal cross section of a woman with an invasive ductal carcinoma right here, nipple would be here, chest walls over here. You can see the flutter of the, of the heart peeking into the field of view here. And so if you watch this thing leap around, the tumor lights up, the adipose tissue, which is storage and not vascularized, there's no enhancement there. And the fibroglandular tissue gives you a, you know, a blush. So each voxel in this time course, or in this image is gonna give you a signal intensity time course that you can then analyze with a kind of a standard pharmacokinetic model to get these parameter maps out. And this stuff is kind of old news now, um, uh, but here's a responder versus a non-responder. So this is locally advanced breast cancer and responder means at the end of neoadjuvant therapy, pre-surgical therapy, there's no tumor, no viable tumor left in the breast or the um, um, axillary lymph nodes, as opposed to a non-responder where there is residual disease. And so what you're looking at here is a map of, of perfusion to the tumor right here. This is this dynamic contrast enhanced MRI. And the reds and the yellows indicate high regions of flow and the blues indicate lower regions. So in the non-responder, no change in tumor size, but definitely less yellows and greens as opposed to the non-responders. You mean the responder? The top one was the responder, right? Yeah. Sorry, yeah. yes sir, yes sir, top yeah, yeah, one is yeah. the responder. Yeah. And the bottom one's the non-responder. Again, really no change in size. Um, uh, in fact, there is no statistically significant change in size over this cohort, but there is, you can see this increase in the yellows and the reds. Um, uh, so perfusion has gone up there. At least that's the interpretation of these data. So when you do your ROC analysis, you end up with an area under the curve of about 0.77 for being able to predict after one cycle of therapy if this patient will have uh, residual disease or not. So that's one measurement just on its own, statistically can separate groups of patients. So there's a, there's a signal there. That's, that's our first measurement. 
Our so, second so, measurement. So, so yep. is this using the pre-therapy to predict the post or using both of these to predict what actually ends up happening? Yeah. So this is before therapy, after one cycle of therapy, depending on right which there, patient is. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. The entire cycle. Yeah. Yeah. But what's I, the key thing about this one, just for the imaging perspective, is that you're able to assess with some degree of accuracy. You know, this is not anything to stop the presses about, but I'm a, this, this value of 0.77. But this is before any changes in tumor size happen, right? Because you're looking at blood flow, which is temporally upstream from changes in size. So you can potentially make this assessment early in the course yeah. of therapy. So then there's the diffusion weighted stuff here. And the idea here is that you have a pixel that has a bunch of cells in it here. And if you are able to deliver a, say a cytoxic therapy that causes these cells to lyse, then there's gonna be more space out here in the extracellular space and, and water has is more free to move. So people have figured out how to map water mobility using diffusion weighted MRI. And you can see here, what, you know, if you have a really cellular dense tissue, then the apparent diffusion coefficient is down here at a lower value. And when you move up here, if there's more extra cellular space here, then this distribution moves to the right. And that's what you see over here. And so people have figured out how to map this um, uh, with MRI. And again, a sagittal cross-section of this tumor and the tumor is here. And so you can see inside the tumor, the, these apparent diffusion coefficient values, these, these ADCs are lower in the side of the tumor than they are outside of the tumor because uh, there's more cellular dense tissue more cells per unit space, more barriers per unit um, space. And so the, the water cannot diffuse as far per unit time. And so the idea is if you do this before and after therapy, if you can um, um, see a reduction in cellularity, then you'll be able to pick it up with this measurement. And that's that's kind of what, what, what people do. Uh, this was a very early um, uh, uh, study on this. Um, uh, and you can see the number of red pixels here to here has increased. So there, the, the apparent diffusion coefficient has gone up, which means the cellularity has gone down at least to first order. And then in the non-responder, there's been no change. So when you do your AUC value, you got a value of 0.81. So the point of these last two slides is that using the contrast enhanced stuff to look at perfusion and the diffusion weighted stuff to look at cellularity, on their own, they can separate populations. And if you group it together, you're being able to predict who can achieve that pathological complete response yep. after the initial round. About 88% of the time you can do it correctly. So that gives motivation for using these parameters as inputs into a, a mechanism-based or a biology-based or a physics-based or whatever you wanna call it, kind of a model. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, and a metaphor that we've been telling now for almost a decade, but I think it's a, a powerful one is, you know, just as satellites provide the data that, for weather forecasting, Quantitative imaging data can provide the data for tumor forecasting. So you have, you know, you have a, this is a global map of humidity. You'll have a global maps of pressure gradients and wind velocities and all these kinds of things go into the Navier-Stokes equations to make a weather forecast. We have, for example, the measurements we just talked about, the perfusion and the cellularity going into some kind of tumor model to make a tumor forecast. And so, so um, uh, yeah. Tom, I'm curious, how, how did this come to you? Like, wh 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 when did it hit you that, that, this is something. Are, are, are you serious? You're, it is, <laughs> yeah, because it's kind of an interesting story. Of, um, at least I think it's interesting. I was I was actually at the beach. This was before children. So my wife and I were at the beach and she was reading her book. And I was I really have always been interested in weather forecasting. I was reading this review of the history of weather forecasting. And there was one paragraph that stuck out to me that said, you know, 100 years ago, there was no physics and meteorology. It was based on the meteorologist's um, uh, experience and guesswork, et cetera, et cetera. And I thought, you know, we can kind of we can kind of change um, a meteorologist to oncologist and meteorology to oncology here and you know there was no physics or mathematics in oncology um, yep. uh, but the, and and then the maybe a hundred years from now people will look back and think there was no physics or ma mathematics in oncology but so that that kind of gave me the idea that this where meteorology was a hundred years ago is you know where we are in oncology nowadays. And so we slowly started stealing these ideas from meteorology to go into our into our own work. So I don't know if that's very interesting, but that but is it is it is very interesting. <laughs> and you know, there are signs showing that you know there is you know stuff happening in this space. Like I I've seen recommendations from both the FDA and the European side where they're sort of saying, look, some some things could be approved without any animal testing, purely based on you know computational. Uh, model. So there's actual recommendations and recommendations coming out um, from perhaps different perspectives, but 
related to the fact that there's increasing trust, you know, in computational models. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's definitely an exciting time. I just we just finished participating with a grant application with um with a team in Europe on trying to do exactly what you just said, try to replace or at least dramatically reduce the number of animal experiments by using these these mechanism based yes. mathematical yeah. models. Yeah. 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 All right, so we, we've got our measurements or we've got two measurements. There's lots of others ways, but for the purposes, we'll try to keep it tight. So these two measurements here um, uh, are gonna now go into our physics and biology-based model. And if you open up chapter 1.1 of any mathematical yeah. biology textbook, they start with exponential growth. You know, n is, in this case, n is the number of our tumor cells, k is the proliferation rate. And so, you know, you can separate the variables and integrate and you get this exponential growth. And well, the thing that's kind of remarkable is that this is actually how cells like grow in a dish at early time points or at the hind limb of a mouse at early time points. But then as time goes on, they reach this carrying capacity. And so you got to account for that. So we take this exponential growth and put on this logistic term right here. So as n gets close to the carrying capacity, this number gets close to one. So one minus the number close to one is close to zero and the rate of change levels off as you approach the carrying capacity. So those are fine. Um, um, they don't carry, uh, characterize spatial variations and you know the heterogeneity across tumors is so well established that you gotta kinda gotta worry about this. And so now you're into chapter two of your mathematical biology textbook and um, uh, we have to introduce a partial differential equation which says over here, the rate of change of the number of cells you know, at position x, y, z and time t is equal to how they're diffusing around and then how they're proliferating. This proliferation term is the same thing that's up here. And here's our diffusion term. And a teaching point is one derivative in time and two derivatives in space is always a diffusion type equation. So that's that we're almost done with the equations, I promise. So this is a repeat of what's on the previous slide just to keep the momentum going. And we note now that tumors don't just expand in a radially symmetric manner. Um, so what we do is we couple that diffusion of the tumor cells to the surrounding mechanical properties of the tissue. And that's what these two components here say. So uh, I'll say this out loud and you can go back and look at it if you're interested or you can just completely ignore it. But this right here is saying what the, the, the divergence of the Cauchy stress tensor is proportional to how the cellularity is changing and space. And so this is, a, this is an ordinary differential equation that we solved for sigma, the stress tensor, and then we convert it to a scalar through the von Mises stress. And at the end of the day, what this is doing is saying, that instead of the tumor cells diffusing out in a radially symmetric manner, they're gonna diffuse preferentially along directions where there's less stress. Yep. Um, um, and and that, that's, that's been known for, you know, from animal studies and from um, uh, like uh, spheroid studies and Rakesh Jain's work for, for a very long time. Do you ever model, so um, do you ever model convection, for example? Or... <laughs> uh, we do. Um, um, we haven't been able to work that into our models. Uh, but, uh, that gets complicated from a numerical yeah, perspective yeah. real fast. And we always try to build these models up um, uh, using the principle of parsimony, right? We try to make them as, you know, follow Einstein's thing, everything should, yeah. should be as complicated as necessary, but no more complicated. So yeah. um, uh, yeah. Yeah, we, yeah. we don't have the data to really. I, I, you know, in, in, you know, I've seen that, for example, some, some studies, including by ourselves, where, of course, it depends on the time scale, but on, in certain That's time right. scales, convection is, is a much less important effect than diffusion, for example, right? But but longer time scale, it might become more and more. Um, yeah, that's anyhow. a good point. So there's, I mean, there's many different ways to model things, but the, the point is that ultimately the proof is in the pudding and how it actually performs. And I think you have some really cool um, actual findings, which I think you'll share with us. So so we'll see. That's right. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. So so this is this is uh, the, the main PDE. There's the mechanics bits on the last slide that, I, that are not on the slide, but now we have a thing describing our movement. We have our proliferation term and then we have our treatment term. And the idea is to use those two MR measures we talked about earlier to try to populate as many terms in here as possible. So wherever there's an N, that's the number of our tumor cells at position X and time T, we're gonna estimate that by our diffusion measurements of cellularity. So yep. wherever there's an N, that, that gets populated. Theta is our carrying capacity and you have a distribution of cell sizes and then the spatial dimension here is the voxel, which you know you control during the MR scan. So we can put a number in here. The other thing that we can put in here is we're estimating how the drug is being delivered mm -hmm. by the um, uh, by the contrast enhanced MRI, and that works. That seems to be working pretty well for the small molecule um, uh, uh, contrast uh, for the small molecule uh, drugs. Um, uh, we have to add corrections to this to account for the bigger, um, uh, but for the bigger drugs. 
but then the thing is that you can't measure everything. So the other things we have to calibrate for is this D, this alpha sub N, which is the efficacy of the drug, yep. and then the proliferation map. So the idea is that you have two time points before therapy and then as early in therapy as you can, and you calibrate this model to those so to the to, to those data points. It's you it's personalize, a you personalize this model for each individual patient. That's exactly right. It's it's done on the individual patient's data to get this how the tails are moving around, how they're responding to therapy, and then a map of the proliferation rate. And that's where the heterogeneity is captured, um, uh, because it's going to be a map across the whole patient. And so here's this little a video or GIF or GIF or whatever. Mm -hmm. This is what's actually measured in the patient. So this is um, uh, the breast tumor right here at three different time points. Um, uh, and we're trying to predict it. So this thing is going to be moving to the right once I hit go here. And you'll want to keep an eye on how this compares to the prediction. And there'll be another image up here that says, how's the drugs being delivered from our from our contrast enhanced stuff. And we're trying to match uh, what the patient is actually receiving or what the experiment, the, what the patient's um, uh, achieving with their response versus what the prediction is. Mm -hmm. So here comes the drug, it's spatially resolved because of the contrast agent kinetics. And every time there's a hit, the drug will be, the, the, the tumor will be hit. And the idea is to compare what's between these two things. Let's do that again. So there's the drug coming in, it's hitting the, the cells, and then you're trying to compare it to what's going down here at the at this last time point. Yep. And then summarizing this over a bunch of patients, this is a, a freeze frame of the observed and predicted for one patient. And spatially, we do a pretty good job of, of capturing um, uh, uh, the residual burden. And then here's the measured cell counts. That's that N in the, in the previous, uh, uh, the N of XT in the, in the equation on the previous slide. Sorry, that's this is the measured one and here's the predicted one, the N that's in the slide previously. And the concordance correlation coefficient is 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 really quite good um, uh, for yeah. both the measured volume change and the, the cell counts change. And then trying to predict the area under the curve comes out to be uh, 0.89 on a patient specific basis where we calibrate on the first two time points and predict whether or not there'll be a pathological complete response or if they'll have residual disease. How, so, how, many, so. how many days into the future is this predicting roughly? Yeah. yeah, that's something I should have at my fingertips. I don't know. I well, this is what I do know. Uh, what do I know? We have it says so. This is triple negative breast cancer. We get adriamycin cytoxin, um, uh, followed by taxol, and I believe it is twelve weeks of AC follow twelve cycles of AC followed by eight cycles of taxol. Right, it could be the reverse of that. That needs to be checked. Um, uh, and so we're we're calibrating um uh, from baseline to two cycles in to that AC therapy and predicting to the end of uh, the thing. So, yeah. So Wait. the time frame is on the order of, uh, uh, I want to say three, three months, three to four months. Yeah. Yep. So we're getting, you're, but you're right. I should have those numbers at my fingertips. Um, we are, <laughs> we're getting pretty good at predicting the oh, spatial and temporal development. Yeah. 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 So, uh, so, so, so now the idea is that if you have a mathematical model, that can actually recapitulate how the tumor is growing in space and time. Then now you can go on the computer and try different um, uh, different treatments. And the most the most immediate one is say, all right, I, the patient's been given this drug. Um, uh, we're not going to change the total amount of drug that was given, but what's the way it should be given? Everybody knows that the way that we give the same drug to everybody is not done correctly because everybody has different pipes, everybody has different yeah. clearance rates, and so forth. But there's not enough patients and resources to sort that out experimentally. But if you have a mathematical model underneath the hood, you can do that. And so that brings us to this notion of digital twins and uh, patient-specific clinical trials. All right. So this is, if you get nothing else out of this presentation, I'd really encourage you to go and look up this paper here. That's by Karen Wilcox's uh, team. Karen is the um, uh, director of our Odin Institute here. She's absolutely brilliant. And she works in aeronautics. Um, uh, so she's an uh, aeronautical engineer. And her and her team came up with this sort of mathematical abstraction of how to think and implement digital twins. And they call their things a physical asset, right? This is their asset. Um, we don't think of patients that way, of course, but that's how they think of it here. Yeah. So there's six components, six, three of them you can touch and feel and live in the real world. So there's the physical asset, there's the things you can do to the system here, there's the actual system itself, and then the, there's the measurements you make on the system. And those things exist in the real world in some sense. And then there's the digital asset, which are sort of the digital analogs of those three. This is your digital state, the parameters, the model inputs that define the computational models. 
the reward, which defines the performance of your system, and then the quantities of interest, you know, what's the remaining useful life on the craft, for example. And so this is kind of a powerful framework to attack problems in oncology. And so I'll now try to translate that formalism yeah. to, um, uh, to, this, to, this, yeah, to this breast cancer thing we're talking about here. So a patient presents, they have some physical state, let's call it S sub I, the I, because we're gonna be iterating. You know, you don't just give a patient once, I mean a drug once and sort of let it go. You intervene and then you make follow-up measurements. And this is kind of the key thing for a digital twin because it's it's not just a mathematical model. You, you, you have to have a mathematical model to do this, but um, the mathematical model, you know, at least in principle, patient presents with their initial data, you calibrate the model, make a prediction for how you should optimally intervene the patient. Then you do that intervention, patient experiences the intervention, then their system changes. So you gotta make more measurements to update your model, which will then show you the next intervention to do. Then you do that to the patient and on and on and on. There's this back and forth between the, the, the patient yeah. and the digital swim. I mean, I like to tell people often that if you just have some some phantom or some some digital um, entity that looks like a patient, that's not a digital twin because it's not operable. Uh, right. you, you need to to you need to have something on which you can operate, or, or you know. So so I guess you're, that's what you're sort of implying here, right? That's right. You have to be able to account for the the intervention, whether it's yeah. operation or systemic therapy or radiation therapy or whatever, because their system is changing dynamically. So you have to capture that in your measurements to update update your model. Yeah. Yeah. So the patients present with whatever their anatomy and morphology uh, is. Uh, we care a lot about mechanics, uh, as we talked about, so that we incorporate that as well. Then you have observational data. You know, we work in imaging science, so we have a lot of different kinds of images, like everybody else who works in imaging science. And then there's the things you can do to the system. You can, of course, order more imaging studies, perhaps a biopsy, depending on where the disease is located in the stage. And you can try to uh, do a, a particular type of treatment. So these are the three things, the physical things you can control. And then there's some of their digital analogs. Uh, control in some sense. You can touch and feel and poke and prod and that kind of stuff. There's the digital state. This is the thing, the finite element mesh, the boundary conditions, you know, the computational model. Yeah. And uh, the inputs here might be treatment regimens. And this is something I wanted to point out because uh, it'll be a recurring theme. This, uh, this column over here, can indicate three different ways to give the same total drug. So the area underneath these curves, this one curve, these three curves, or this 21 curves, that area is fixed. And this is showing what we do now for adromycin cytoxin. One hit, three weeks later, you'll get another hit. That's probably not the best for everybody. Maybe you need one third of it once a week. And then the other extreme, which is not actually logistically possible, but it's analogous to what we do in radiation therapy, yep. is a little bit every day, right? Yep. And so it's likely that one of these is better for Miss Jane Doe than it is for Miss Mary Smith, um, uh, right? And so that we have our quantities of interest as well, um, uh, distribution of therapies, tumor shape, those kinds of things, and then our rewards. And this is a key take home point here. This is a surface plot of looking at a range of doses and a range of schedules to give you a range of outcomes. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a mathematical model, this surface is impossible to make for an individual patient because you can't try a bunch of different doses or different different schedules to build up your training set to then pick one out for Miss Jane Doe. That's just, it doesn't exist. That, that training set doesn't exist and it will never exist. It'll never exist because the, 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 the um, uh, drugs are getting more and more specific to certain um, uh, features in, in, in cancer and, um, uh, and, the, and the cancers themselves are getting more and more specific in their diagnoses. You know, cancer is not just one disease. It's somewhere north of a hundred. So, Miss Jane Doe doesn't just get cancer or breast cancer or even triple negative breast cancer. It's one of the six subtypes. So what's really exciting about this, um, uh, this still sends shivers up my spine, is if you have a mathematical model that can accurately recapitulate how the tumors are growing in space and time, then you can go on the, tr on the computer and try a host of doses and a host of schedules, come up with a surface plot, and then find out where on the surface is her optimal regimen. And you know, frequently we find that the optimal regimen is far away from what the patient actually actually receives. I mean, in, so in a way, patient... in a way, Tom, um, a physician, you know, does some kind of, you know, sometimes at least does some kind of a thought experiment, you know, imagining, you know, given this image, if I do this, what will happen? But that's a sort of a very crude thing. It's not necessarily quantitative. And you know, some of these things are extremely complicated to model. And so, so physicians in their mind are thinking about alternatives, but if you provide them with actual, you know, virtual therapies and, and you know, 
that that opens up new possibilities about you know better optimization, right? I think that's absolutely true. I think treating oncologists, the colleagues I talked to about this, they have, you know, maybe not this surface plot, but they've got something like this in their mind already based on their experience and expertise that they've encountered. Um, uh, and they don't have as many options, of course, because they have, you know, their standards of care, you know, yep. the patient presents with triple negative breast cancer, they can do AC and, and, uh, and, and you know, a handful of different therapeutic regimens. Um, uh, but, uh, but to have it, to have it rigorous like this, to see what the options are, and then being able to do things like balance uh, efficacy with toxicity, that requires you know one of these mathematical models with all of that stuff baked into it and then calibrated for the individual, right? Yeah. So I think you're right. We're just <laughs> there's no new ideas under the sun, right? We're just oh, trying no. to trying to make rigorous um, uh, things that you know a treating physician might be doing um uh, intuitively on their own. Yeah. Uh, Right. Okay. So the patient presents with their physical state. You make your measurements. That lets you populate your computational model. You track your quantities of interest to try to maximize your reward. And then you make your next set of measurements. That brings it here. And the whole thing cycles around again and again and again until you get, you know, hopefully an optimized outcome. I wanted to drill down on this one just a little bit more here because this is probably the main take home point right here. Okay. We've built these physics based models on describing blood flow, interstitial transport, and then their interaction throughout the, the entire breast. And this is, um, a, this is a skeleton of the larger vessels that are present in, the, in, the, in this woman's breast. Of course, it's different in every woman and it's different from right to left in a, in a woman. And then here's the tumor right here in this, I don't know what this color this is, some sort of mauve maybe, I, don't, I actually don't know, <laughs> magenta. But um, uh, so we model the blood flow through the network through um, uh, Poisy or Poisou's law right here. The, the, the flow is proportional to the fourth power of the radius and it changes as the pressure goes down the length of the vessel, flux across from inside the vessel to outside is characterized by starling. And then once you're out there in that, you know, porous, porous media of the extravascular space, you're looking at Darcy's law. So we calibrate these data to, um, uh, to the patient specific imaging data, and then we can run the fluid mechanics models to, um, uh, to, to, to simulate how the drug is being delivered after a single injection, this will cycle back around, and where's the hit? There's the hit of therapy. And this is once every 21 days. And so the tumor only sees drug for a little bit of time before it all goes away. Whereas if you give the same total dose over multiple injections, you can see it's, it's pulsing right here. Then the idea is that the drug is bathed in the, in the, sorry, that the tumor is bathed in the drug for a longer period of time. The next slide pulls out some freeze frames from, from this. And so this is the top frame right here. This is the one on the left from the previous slide. And that's what you give your big bolus of drug at once, but given the half-life of these things, really by day five, there's not much left in and around the tumor as opposed to the other extreme, which is a little bit every day. Um, um, you can see that the concentration in and around the drug stays high and that we've just pulled the tumor out here to, to try to drive it home. Is, you know, there's a lot of concentration early on, but then for the rest of the, the three-week cycle, there's very little as opposed to here, you're getting a pulse and you're maintaining a high um, um, degree of, of, of drug in and around the tumor. And so at the end of the day, you're getting a, a potentially another 60% uh, decrease in, a, in tumor size. And of course, this is all simulated, but it's using a model that we think is pretty good for predicting treatment response. And all we've done here yeah. is just change the way the drug is given. So it's, it's really just dipping our toes into this deep pool of trying to optimize their exactly. therapeutic regimen. So, so, so in a totally sort of different problem, in radio pharmaceutical therapy, we, you know, in, in that context, people uh, commonly do uh, bolus injections, you know, give or take. But you know, we've actually tried um, uh, different kinds of infusion or multi-bolus injections because those are not, yeah. really, and nobody has actually sort of investigated them to our knowledge. Um, and so, what we're, we've seen, for example, is that it doesn't because it's all, all about balancing between. Uh, organs at risk versus tumors, how much dose is being delivered to them. And so we're, we're not, when we do that, we don't see an advantage there, but we do see that for the same amount of radioactivity injected, we're going to get more uh, delivery simply because there's less saturation of the receptors, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah. anyway, these computational models open up the, the possibilities to, to, to investigate certain things that normally are difficult to investigate and at least ask certain questions and then, of course, try them out in reality. Uh, I love hearing this. This is uh, this is music to my ears. It's it's great to hear it happening in a different 
in a different area of treatment. But you're 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 spot on. We can't we can't try all the different regimens. You might want to try to see which one is the best one to 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 just saturate but not oversaturate the receptors in, in your case. Um, but if you have a model underneath the hood, then you could compute potentially what the what the optimal uh, way to uh, intervene is. That's very exciting to hear about. Uh, okay, so we're, we're, we're getting near the, the end here. Um, yeah. uh, this is just an example of, of dots rather than looking at 10 patients like we did, uh, 10 versions of what was on the previous slide here. This is what the patients actually received here for these blue dots. So yeah. this looks the percent change in their tumor volume. So for example, this patient had about a 50% reduction in volume. These two patients looks like they had progressive disease right here. And then the red one using similar stuff to what we talked about on the previous slide was trying to come up with the best alternative therapeutic regimen. And you can see sometimes we don't do any better than what they actually receive. That's here and here, and this one is basically identical. But in other cases, there is a pretty big switch. And in these two, we've gone, we at least in principle, have moved from uh, progressive disease down to stable disease, or in this case, stable disease down to a partial response. And this is just changing the timing of how you're gi giving the, the therapeutic, not the total dose. And so on average, in this small data set, there is about um, a 20%, 21% reduction in tumor size by just changing right. the timing of the delivery. Effectively, you're saying, you're, you know, had we done this, uh, you know, these alternative regimens, we would have significantly changed uh, and, and improved, uh, you know, uh, responses to therapy, which of course sets you up to, to, to motivate clinicians and clinical, you know, people that run clinical trials to, to actually try these, right? So this yeah, is- Yeah, I mean, which- that's right. What you'd really like to do is do a head-to-head -head comparison, right? Standard of care versus treatment as, as indicated by your, your mathematical model, your digital twin. Um, yeah. uh, we're, we're now designing those studies and we're just trying to see this, the first round of studies from, um, um, uh, from after lots of conversations was, was to actually implement it and do the, the, the digital twinning and make your predictions and then share them with the oncologists and the patients with no idea of actually changing the therapy. Just how are they going to receive this data? How does the patient feel about receiving therapeutic regimens based on a um, um, mathematical model in a computer simulation? How is this going to change the oncologist's um, uh, point of view of how they should proceed? You know, as a with this thing, which is would be a decision support tool. So the first thing is just to assess, you know, just get it into the system and see how how it's received by both the provider and the um, um you know you know the patient. On the other side, we can do preclinically. We have done this. You know, we've calibrated a model to a to an in vivo study in uh, breast cancer in mice. And then we've tried the optical therapeutic, uh, optimal, we've uh, sorted out what the optimal intervention should be and actually shown that it's, that it's, um, uh, that it's, in, that it's improving the outcome in, in, at least in these mice. So there's, there's something here. Yep. I don't know if the way we're, we're formulating it is the best way, but uh, I'm confident that this will, this will happen in, a, in our lifetime. <laughs> uh, all right, so we're right here at the end of the summary. As uh, so optimizing outcomes relies on considering each patient's unique characteristics. All the stuff we talked about today was using was using individual characteristics from the individual patient and not training data sets. And the idea is that you can achieve this through this mechanism-based mathematical modeling to um, have this digital twin that goes back and forth between the patient and the um, uh, and the model itself. The other two components of this, which is a whole, you know, is is, a, is, a, is the rest of it, is to apply optimal control theory to your to your model once you get it working. And the idea here is you have a certain amount of drug that you can deliver, what's the best way to deliver? Yep. And so, yeah. And then the other thing is you have to keep updating the data using uh, approaches um, uh, from data assimilation, which is something else we've stolen from, from uh, meteorology. All right, so the thing is that this guy, Gilbert Daniels at the very end or, of his study for the pilots, he said, um, uh, when I left Harvard, it was clear to me that if you wanted to design something for an individual human, the average was completely useless. Wow. Perhaps being over dramatic there, but but there's a lot of truth to it. Yeah. And so we might say, if you just want to design a treatment schedule that's optimal for an individual, you got to rely on their individual characteristics. And now we believe there's a suite of mathematical techniques that are practical for for doing this kind of thing on a patient specific basis. And then, like I said a couple of times, that this is probably inevitable. If you look at the history of science, once we mathematize something, we get pretty good at it. And these are the people who do the work. You know, I just roll in the corner in the fetal position and worry about how to pay for everything, but uh, but they're the real brains behind the operation. Uh, thank you very much, Tom. That was absolutely amazing. And thank you for all the uh, 
uh, amazing efforts that, that you're leading uh, and just spending time with us going through these. I, I think I think the, the future is very bright. You know, computational oncology is 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 going to be um, really making a difference in, 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 in healthcare and patient lives. And, and thank you for, for being a leader, leader in this space. Well, thank you so much for having me for all those kind words. I'm a, I uh, really appreciate it. I, I don't know if we're really leading things, but we're, we're trying our hardest. I'll say that we're trying really hard. <laughs> thank you. Thank, no, no, absolutely. Uh, so thank, thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Take care.